So I wanted to talk a little bit about collagen. I wanted to talk about the advantages of disadvantages of collagen and help you a little bit understand what the problem is in scleroderma and what needs to be done to be able to truly change it. So as you hear of therapies being developed, what it's gonna take to really be able to change um, the fibrosis in scleroderma. So first of all, some of what I'm gonna talk about is bench research. So it's research that's being done in the laboratory in order to find a cure, but it's also research that we're doing to find the cause, which is important. So I'm gonna summarize some of what we're doing, but introduce concepts that would help you understand it, hopefully other research as well that's happening at institutions uh, near where you live. All right, so often when scientists start talking about their research, it's sort of this jumbled up alphabet soup, right? It's like a foreign language, everybody zones out. So when that starts happening, raise your hands and I'll tone it down. But I'm gonna try and explain things in more lay terms um, to try and help you understand the concepts. But definitely raise your hand. This is informal as far as I'm concerned. You have questions, something you don't understand, just stop me. All right, so why is research important? Research is important because research, let me see if this has a laser pointer. Maybe not, oops. Okay, well, we'll do without. Research is important because research is what leads to the discoveries that lead to the therapies. So you often hear of treatments um, that are being developed by fairly large companies that are getting advertised, but really the research that's the basis of those treatments starts in the laboratories of scientists, mostly at academic institutions. So that's where it all begins, and eventually through development, it goes through other phases and ends up with the larger companies. And why is fibrosis research important? So we consider scleroderma a prototype disease. And this is important when you also speak to your representatives, congressmen, as you increase awareness about scleroderma. So one of the hallmarks of scleroderma is fibrosis, and we're gonna talk about what fibrosis exactly is. But fibrosis is important because fibrosis is not just in scleroderma, although in scleroderma it affects more than one organ, but fibrosis is actually a feature of a lot of other important diseases that are responsible for a lot of the deaths in developed countries. So we know that fibrosis can affect nearly any organ. We know that causes a lot of mortality, and there are really no FDA-approved drugs that currently can stop or reverse fibrosis. And so when I say it affects a lot of organs, and it's important, it's because a lot of the standard illnesses and diseases you hear about are truly also fibrosis. For example, when you hear of in the liver, whether it's hepatitis C or alcoholic liver disease, that's fibrosis of the liver. When you hear about somebody having a heart attack, that's fibrosis, scarring in the heart. So see, these are common things. Who doesn't know of someone who's had a heart attack, for example? When you hear of even eye diseases like glaucoma, there's fibrosis in glaucoma. So the end result of a lot of the common diseases is fibrosis. And that's why we can say that fibrosis is responsible for nearly 45% of deaths in the developed world. Because if we add up all these diseases together, one can understand how important fibrosis research is. So here's another listing of the diseases in which you see fibrosis. Again, you will recognize a lot of them. So obviously, scleroderma often gets listed under skin, but we all know it affects a lot of other organs as well. But keloids falls into that. Here's the heart attack, congestive heart failure. If you look at liver, uh, we mentioned alcoholic liver disease, the hepatitis viruses, but there's a lot of others, such as autoimmune hepatitis, uh, primary biliary cirrhosis in lung. There's multiple diseases whose hallmark is fibrosis. Asthma is fibrosis around the airways. Asthma is fairly common. Cystic fibrosis has an element of fibrosis. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is another pulmonary fibrosis condition that's not that different from scleroderma lung disease. So several other organs and diseases whose hallmark is fibrosis. All right. So here's another example of, of um, the diseases. And one of the others that's important to keep in mind that's a very common one is diabetes. You know, diabetics get this diabetic nephropathy that affects the kidneys. That's fibrosis. So fairly common out there. So when you talk to your congressman, emphasize the importance of scleroderma because although all these other diseases have fibrosis that affects only one organ, 
scleroderma, the fibrosis affects multiple organs, and that's why it's important to do research on scleroderma. Because insights that we gain on fibrosis and scleroderma is likely to apply to a lot of other diseases. Okay, so what is fibrosis? In a nutshell, fibrosis is excess production of what we call extracellular matrix proteins. Those proteins include collagen, as an example. They include other proteins like fibronectin, and the, so there's a family of them. But we're going to use collagen as an example because historically it's been known that in scleroderma there's an increase in collagen because one of the first research papers on scleroderma that was published in the early 70s by Carwile Leroy mentioned the increased production of collagen in scleroderma. And that was in skin fibroblasts. So what is collagen? Collagen is this molecule that's made by the cells, and it's secreted outside the cells, and it gets deposited. So you see it in these things. And you need a certain amount of collagen to have healthy tissues, health, healthy organs, healthy skin. So when you're young, there's plenty of collagen, and the collagen is nicely arranged and cross-linked. So each collagen molecule gets linked to neighboring ones, so they form um, this network, basically. As we get older, there's less collagen, and the collagen is weaker, and that's when we get the wrinkles. So optimal amount of collagen, you get healthy tissues, healthy skin, young skin. Too little collagen, you start getting wrinkles and more fragile skin. Too much collagen, you can end up with something like that, depending on where you choose to put it. But really, if it's not optional, what you end up with is fibrosis. So in skin, if this is thin skin, the collagen, so this is the outside layer of the skin, the epidermis, and this is as you go inward, this is the dermis, and this is where the collagen is. The more collagen you have, the thicker the skin gets, and that's fibrosis. The advantage of knowing that is we can measure the thickness of the skin and tell, can tell the extent or the amount of fibrosis. So we can use it to our advantage to do that with. That obviously can affect other organs other than the skin. So one of the other uh, fibrotic organs we look at is lung, because you can imagine as you get more and more collagen in the lung that's cross-linked, it makes the lung stiff. So normally when you inhale, your lungs expand. And as they get really stiff, you try and inhale, but they can't expand, right? So um, that's fibrosis of the lungs. All right, so the story that I'm gonna tell you is gonna start with collagen as we did, and it's gonna end up in collagen. That's why I have it as all roads lead to collagen. All right, so sclerodermas, for those who don't know the facts, as you need them to go on your advocacy trips, is a connective tissue disease, more commonly found in women than in men, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit how we know um, the information we know as to why it might be a little more frequent in women. Um, fibrosis is one of the hallmarks. Mortality, this is old data, so don't look at that and don't panic. Things have changed, but to emphasize the importance of disease, it's always better to give the numbers that make an impact. And there's different forms, obviously, of scleroderma. In the systemic form, there's what we call diffuse cutaneous disease, limited cutaneous, and there's something called systemic sclerosis and overlap, which is when you have scleroderma and overlap with lupus or scleroderma and overlap with rheumatoid arthritis. And that comes from the Greek, <clears throat> where derma stands for skin and sclero stands for hard, and hard because of the excess collagen and matrix proteins. All right, and this is sort of what it looks like. You all know that. Diffuse systemic sclerosis affects the skin on most of the body. Limited usually doesn't go beyond the knees or the elbows, but also affects the face. And there's something called systemic sclerosis sine scleroderma. That's for patients who have internal organ involvement but no skin involvement. All right. So I look at scleroderma as a puzzle in research. We put pieces together. We look at cells called fibroblasts that we grow out of the skin and the lung tissues. Um, we look at different things, features of scleroderma, and eventually the point is, as you put the puzzle together, for most of you who have done puzzles, you get to see the big picture. And as you piece it together, then that's how we try and figure out what the cause is and ultimately what the cure is. And I started out looking at features of scleroderma that include our genes, you know, what role do our genes play in getting scleroderma, but also what role does the environment play? So nature versus nurture. 
We know that there are many environmental factors that have been linked to scleroderma or scleroderma-like illnesses. Many of them, some are occupational, like silica dust, coal miners get exposed to it, vinyl chloride, trichloroethylene, for example, in the dry cleaning industry. Those are all documented um, in various publications. There's geographical clustering near airports, like Heathrow Airport, at one point even the Boston uh, Logan Airport. Drugs such as bleomycin. Bleomycin is a chemotherapy drug used for cancer treatment, and they noticed that patients who were getting it for their cancer were developing lung fibrosis. So now we use it in the lab to cause fibrosis in mice to study. Um, and there are things you can ingest that have been linked with scleroderma-like illnesses. So we know there are environmental factors out there. The problem is not everybody with scleroderma has been exposed to those factors. And these factors don't cause scleroderma in everybody who gets exposed to them. So that makes it a little bit difficult. So, for example, in the toxic oil syndrome, which happened, I think it was in the 1980s, with contaminated oil that was sold in Spain and thousands of people got sick, we noticed that there was a high incidence in women in the chronic phase. And that's an environmental factor that people got exposed to, right? They ingested it. So the question is, is it hormonal? Because there's more women in that phase. So we started looking at the obvious hormone found in women, which is estrogen. And what we found, and this is, I'll show you a model of what we do, is if you add estrogen to skin, this is skin. So this is skin at baseline. This is skin you add estrogen to. And I think you can appreciate where the green arrow is, it's much thicker, right? So we know estrogen can cause fibrosis. And actually, when we saw this, we went back to the literature and saw that the companies that developed hormone replacement therapies had in their publications that they noticed collagen went up in the skin of the women who were testing the therapies. And when they stopped the therapies, the dermal thickness and the collagen went back to normal. So now when we know that estrogen can cause increased thickness of the skin and increased collagen. So then we looked in scleroderma patients in their blood. And we noticed that in patients with the diffuse form of scleroderma, estrogen levels are much higher than age and gender matched controls. So these are postmenopausal women who are not on hormone replacement therapy who have very high levels of estrogen. The question is why? Then we thought, well, what about the men? There are men with scleroderma too. So then we looked at the men. And interestingly enough, men with scleroderma have even higher levels of estrogen than the women. So clearly, we know estrogen causes increased collagen, and we know it's higher in scleroderma patients. So that makes it a little bit easier, right? Because there are many agents out there that block estrogen or reduce estrogen, and that's sort of the next step for us is to test some of those agents. All right, other, other environmental factors. So for example, we know that less than 5% of workers exposed to vinyl chloride get scleroderma-like illness. So the question is, why just 5%? Why do the other 95% don't get scleroderma or scleroderma-like illness? So is there a genetic component that makes these 5% more susceptible to getting scleroderma if they're exposed to vinyl chloride? So for that, we basically looked at the genetics in scleroderma patients. And the golden tool for figuring out whether your genes or the environment are more important in the illness that you develop is to look at twins. Because if you have identical twins, you would expect that if something's purely inherited, purely genetic, then both are gonna have it. And if something is not genetic, then both will not have it, right? If it's environmental, then whichever one is exposed might have it. So that's what we did. So we collected twins to look at what happens in twins. So, when we look at inheritance of any disease, there are certain genetic rules you follow. If, so, if a disease is called, or an, a gene that's inherited called autosomal dominant, then 100% of identical twins will both have it, and 50% of fraternal twins. If it's autosomal recessive, 100% of identical, 25% of fraternal twins. And if something that's multifactorial, where you, maybe you have a genetic background that makes you more susceptible, more prone, but is not enough, to develop disease, but you need the environmental factors to trigger the phenotype, then 40 to 60% of identical will have it compared to 4 to 8% of fraternal. So more in identical than fraternal, but nowhere near the 100% you see with the others. 
And for other autoimmune conditions, the data was already available. It had been published. So we know in Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease occurs in both twins, in 44% of identical twins, 4% of fraternal. For diabetes, it's more in identical than fraternal. For multiple sclerosis, more in identical than fraternal. And the same with the other rheumatic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. It occurs more frequently in identical than fraternal, but you notice none of them are 100% in identical, which tells us these are not purely genetic. You don't just inherit a gene and that's it. It's multifactorial. There are other things that are involved. So when we looked at the, the twins, what we noticed first is you've all had an ANA test done, right? Does anybody not know what an ANA test is? All right, so it's just looking for generic antinuclear antibodies. What we noticed is if we looked at the identical twins, all of them had these ANAs, whether they had scleroderma or not. The fraternal twins, fewer had it, and this is first degree relatives, even fewer. So it looked as you become more genetically identical, you're more likely to have a positive ANA. But what about having scleroderma? So this is our cohort. We had 45 total twin pairs where either one or both had scleroderma. And what we noted is concordance. So how many twins both have scleroderma was really low, whether they were identical or fraternal, average 5%. So unlike the other rheumatic diseases where there was a higher percentage in the identical twins, in this case, in scleroderma, it's really low, and it's low in both identical and fraternal. So that told us that this is not purely genetic. This is more environmental than genetic, that maybe you have a genetic background that makes you more susceptible, but it's certainly not enough. There must be something else that happens or that you get exposed to that then triggers scleroderma in one twin and not the other. So this is how we think it happens. We think that we are born with a genetic background that makes us more prone to things. And as we go through life, we go through steps and exposures in life, experiences, whatever they are, whether it's chemicals or viruses. And depending which exposures you have and when you have them, that will make you more likely to develop a variety of autoimmune diseases, including scleroderma. And that is probably why we often see clustering of other autoimmune diseases in um, relatives of patients with scleroderma. You often hear, I have scleroderma, but my sister has lupus, my mom has RA, et cetera. So that's probably why is everybody has this genetic background that makes them prone, but it's what they get exposed to that makes a difference as to what they develop. So that's how we were trying to piece sort of the causes, right? Is it genetic or is it environmental? Now, there are genetic alterations, changes that happen on top of your DNA that you are not necessarily born with that you can acquire through life. So initially, we thought that once you had your DNA, you had your DNA, and that was it for life. But over the past several years, we've come to learn that there are changes that happen on top of the DNA <clears throat> that are influenced by a lot of things, what you get exposed to, what you eat, what medicines, drugs you take, uh, all sorts of things. Those are called epigenetics. Epi means on top of, genetics, your DNA. All right, so they occur on top of the DNA. We call them imprinting. And they were first identified in corn in 1910. They were only confirmed in mammals in 1991. In research, 1991 is fairly recent. And they're carried for several generations. We know that once one person has them, the, the grandchildren, great-grandchildren will have those changes. All right, so the way it works, one example of such changes is this is our DNA. Our DNA has basically four letters in it, C, G, T, and A. And on top of the C, you can add a methyl group or a methylation, which is the orange circles. And depending where you add that, it can either turn off a gene or it can turn on a gene, depending on where they're located. And that's how epigenetic changes or changes on top of the DNA can, for example, affect collagen production, because they may turn it on or they may turn it off. All right, and this is what it really looks like on the DNA. So these are the methyl groups on the DNA. And where they're there, they can help the DNA kind of unwind, open up. And when they're not, it kind of tightens a little more and gets more bound up. Okay, so what causes these epigenetic changes? A lot of things. As we develop in utero, we have changes. 
There are a lot of environmental factors, including chemicals, drugs, cigarette smoke, that can cause such changes in us. Aging, we all have changes on top of our DNA as we age, and then our diet. So diet and lifestyle basically can change our DNA, right? So what are the kinds of environmental things that are known to change our DNA? This is a list of some of them. It's not a comprehensive list. There's a lot of research ongoing. But heavy metals, pesticides, diesel, tobacco smoke, radioactivity, some viruses, some bacteria, some nutrients, some of the foods you eat, a lot of things can change our DNA. So the bad news is these changes that happen on the top of our DNA accumulate with age. You get more and more and more as you get older. And they're carried, like I mentioned, for several generations. The good news is they can be altered because I told you nutrients, um, diet can change them back, basically. And so that brings the concept of personalized nutrition and the way medicine is going, is you can come up with a, a nutrition plan that's unique to each individual depending on the changes they have in their DNA. All right, let me give you examples of how that works. Royal jelly causes those changes on top of the DNA, epigenetic changes in the bees, and that's what determines who's gonna be the queen bee based on those changes. Uh, it was known during World War II that uh, pregnant women who had a really poor diet, there was very little food, um, the children of those women as adults had a much higher risk for cardiovascular disease and that was tracked back to those changes on top of the DNA because of the poor diet of the mother. So another example from World War II, um, you know, during the war in Europe, they studied a cohort of people who had gone through famine. There was no food, there was a lot of famine, and then the war ended and food became readily available and a lot of people went overboard making up for lost time having the food available. And what happened, is they tracked the generations of these individuals and over time found that their children and grandchildren had shorter lifespans because of that extreme, the two extremes in diet that changed their DNA that was carried for generations. And also another nutrient, for example, that we know causes these types of changes is folic acid, vitamin B12, which are given to pregnant women. And those actually act as methyl donors, so they add methyl groups to the DNA. So a lot of everyday examples of how things around us in our diet can influence, influence our DNA. So basically, you are what your grandmother ate. This is basically what it comes down to. So, and now it's a, it's a very actually hot uh, field of research because in cancer and a lot of diseases, these epigenetic changes are being pursued because there's ways to manipulate them and change them to impact the outcome. Okay. So. Do these epigenetic changes explain what we see in the twins, why one twin has scleroma and one doesn't? Well, we're working on that right now, but I can tell you that we have already picked up very obvious changes that we see in all the patients, but none in their healthy twins. And we're following up what those mean for scleroderma. So, I next want to move on to kind of bring the story of the collagen back full circle. How many of you know who Louis Pasteur is? Have heard of you, but okay. So famous scientist from France who said, chance only favors the prepared mind. That's one thing I tell a lot of the junior people that I mentor because a lot of the accidental discoveries in science occur only if your mind is open to getting an answer you are not expecting. All right, so the reason I wanna go back is we started with increased collagen in fibrosis and in scleroderma and one of the therapies that's being developed goes back to collagen, so full circle. So here we are, a disease that has too much collagen, and we came across this observation that a piece of one of the collagens, so there are a lot of different collagens, collagen one, two, three, it goes up in numbers. So one of these collagens, collagen 18, has a little piece of it here that gets cleaved off or split off of it called endostatin. And endostatin had been developed as a treatment for cancer metastases because endostatin prevents the formation of new blood vessels that cancer cells need to spread. And it's actually completed phase four clinical trials in China for that, and it's effective at blocking metastases, but it's very expensive to make. All right, so what we had come across is a gene that we, we had found, we had discovered was increased in scleroderma called IGFPP5, that stands for 
insulin-like growth factor binding protein 5. I'm not going to go there because I'm not going to lose you with the chicken soup at this point. But just to know, we found a gene that was very increased in scleroderma skin and lungs compared to uh, controls. And we found that that gene increases endostatin, which is that piece of collagen. And so is that logical? Something increased in scleroderma increases collagen. Makes sense, right? Because we know coll collagen is excessive in scleroderma. There's too much collagen. So it makes sense that something would increase it. So our thought was, if, if what, that's what's happening and a piece of collagen is going up, then that must be what's causing the fibrosis, right? Makes sense. But what we found instead is it was the reverse. So this is collagen. This is what's called a Western blot. It's an assay in the lab that allows you to detect a protein. In this case, the protein is collagen. So this is the amount of collagen we see in this sample. And this is the amount of collagen we see in the sample, so a lot less. So this is endostatin. We added endostatin, which is here E to the cells, and saw that instead of causing fibrosis and more collagen, since it's a piece of collagen, actually shut it down, right? That's where having the prepared mind comes in. We were expecting this to increase collagen. What we found was it did the reverse, right? So here's an opportunity, something that causes the reverse. It shut down everywhere you see the E, you see how the collagen is shut down, but it did that too to other extracellular matrix proteins. So I said collagen is increased, but other matrix proteins like fibronectin. So we found this molecule that's a piece of collagen, which is found in excess in scleroderma, but that piece turns around and shuts down, basically, fibrosis. So we were pretty excited and celebrating. I had to add the curly hair. But we ended up taking this endostatin molecule and breaking it up into fragments. Because in scleroderma, how many of you have had your doctor look at your um, nail fold? Like put a little goo and look. Okay, they look because the little blood vessels there form are, are, are not healthy or they don't form at all or they can't go all the way there. So there's poor blood, bless, blood vessel formation there. So we know endostatin blocks blood vessel formation, right? That's why it's used for cancer. So we didn't want that feature of it in scleroderma because we did not want to make the blood vessels even worse. So we decided to chop it up and see if we can find one piece of it that affects blood vessels, but another piece that shuts down the collagen. That way we can separate the effects. And that's what happened. Basically, that piece is the one that stops blood vessel formation. And this piece is the one that shuts down the collagen. So this piece that we call E4, it's what's moving forward for treatment. So it's called a peptide. What a peptide is, is just a stretch of amino acids. E4 is 48 such amino acids. And what we've tested it is in a lot of models. We've tested it in mice to show in mouse skin that if you cause um, fibrosis, so we take bleomycin, this chemotherapy drug that causes fibrosis, and inject it into the mice, and it causes fibrosis in the mice. Then we inject this peptide, and we show that if you look at how thin the skin is here, you add bleomycin, it gets thicker. You add the peptide with it, it goes back to being thin. So showing that it can reduce the dermal fibrosis. Same in the lung. If we add it to the lung, uh, it helps to, yes, ma'am. Not necessarily, because Raynaud's is more the, the, the response to cold and the spasms, although um, in scleroderma patients, it's not just a spasm, right? The blood vessels are, the opening in them is getting narrower. So potentially, although we have not tested it, potentially it could be. So we started with humans, we tested in mice, and then we decided at the end, well, how do we know that this is going to work? because you can cure anything in mice. Mice are the easiest to cure of diseases. We can experimentally induce a lot of different diseases in mice, and there's always ways you can manipulate them and cure them. So for me, I wanted to know that something's going to work in humans, right? Because 95% or more of drugs that are developed in the world are tested in mice, work in mice, and fail in humans. 95% or more fail in human clinical trials. We're not mice. We don't always respond like mice. So I had to come up with a way to know that this is likely to work in humans before you get to the human trials. So this is what I did. 
I went and grabbed what I skin from tummy tuck surgeries. So this is skin from one person who had tummy tuck, right? This is my hand over there. So that gives you an idea. There were two pieces like that. This piece, that's the skin. This is the fat. That's what you get out of tummy tuck. So over there is just the fat. We had peeled off the skin. So what we started doing is peeling off the human skin, injecting it with things that we know cause fibrosis or increased thickness of skin, and then injecting our peptide to see if we can change that. The way we figured it is if we can change that in human skin, then we have lower risk as we go to a human trial because it is more likely to work in the human trial. Did I do that? Okay. So this is what it really looks like in the lab. We cut the human skin. We put it in this pink medium. The medium has nutrients just to keep the skin healthy and happy. And what we do is we keep the upper layer of the skin, so the epidermis exposed to the air, and then we put the lower layer in that nutrient so it pretends like it's in the human body. And then we put it in an incubator that's kept at human body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. And then what we do is we inject it. So I'm showing you here three pieces of skin. Can you tell me if I say this is one, two, and three, which one's thicker to the eye? Three. Perfect. Who wants a job in a lab? <laughs> and that's what it is. Three was injected with a protein that we know causes fibrosis or dermal thickness. So that was the first test is can we use human skin as a concept, as a model? And the, the answer is it works. You can cause fibrosis in human skin. All right. So this is what it looks like in reality. So if you now take the skin and you slice down through it, so you're looking at a section sliced down through it. This is the epidermis or outer layer. This is the dermis. What we did is we took normal skin, injected it with something that causes fibrosis, and look how much thicker now it is. So you can do that experimentally. Am I in the way of your photos? OK. All right, so we can do it. And this is, as it gets thicker, as you increase the dose, yes. In this picture, we used a factor or a protein that is experimentally used in all the labs that do fibrosis research. It's called TGF beta or transforming growth factor beta. It's one of the most potent agents that experimentally you can use to cause fibrosis. And the blue that you see is collagen because that's a special stain called Masson trichrome that we use in the lab that picks up collagen. So the more blue you have, the more collagen you have. So visually you can tell we can cause fibrosis. So then what we did is we injected our peptide and so everywhere you see E4, which is here and here, you see we can cause the fibrosis and then we can reduce it in human skin with this peptide. So that tells me it's working in human skin Therefore, it's likely to work in humans, not just in mice. All right, so we started out with identifying it in humans, testing it in all the models in the cells in vitro, which means outside the body, when you grow the cells outside the body. In vivo means inside the body, so when we tested it in the mice. And then ex vivo, which is the skin that we take out and grow as an organ in the lab. The question was, how was it doing that? And that was important because if we could figure out how it was doing it, then we would figure out what it would take to reduce fibrosis. So I'm gonna abbreviate a few years worth of work to tell you this is how it works and this is the way it, therapies should work. So what we found is this peptide is taking the collagen that's in the matrix and I told you it gets linked together. So these are the cross links that make the collagen molecules. And it's taking the enzyme that causes these cross-links and it's reducing it, it's lowering the levels of it. So there's not as many cross-links, which means now these bonds or interactions between the collagen molecules are not as stable. They're more flimsy, basically. And then these enzymes that we know break down collagen can come and clear away the collagen and get in there and break it down and take it away. And the reason I mentioned that is often you hear of drugs being developed that target one thing or one molecule. And often these end up failing in the clinical trials uh, because I think targeting one thing is really not gonna work for scleroderma. You need to target several things at once. You need to be able to stop the collagen from being made in excess. 
you need to take the collagen that's there and be able to break it down and take it away. And so targeting one molecule only is not likely to be effective. And that's why targeting one molecule often works in mice, but it usually doesn't work in humans. So as a concept, we need something that can do multiple steps in scleroderma in order to be able to develop an appropriate therapy. All right, so that's, we went back to collagen, right? Increased collagen in scleroderma, and ultimately a therapy we're developing that is a piece of collagen. So kind of ironic in a way. All right, so what are we doing about it now? So peptides are expensive to make. I mentioned that endostatin, which is used for cancer trials, has been really expensive to make in the scale that's needed to give to cancer patients. So we, we partnered um, with a company that has this unique way of making peptides very inexpensively. They make it in plants. And they make it in a plant that's in the tobacco family. So this is um, the, the plant itself. It's a distant relative of tobacco. And they make it in the plant leaves. They, the plant leaves, they engineer them, so they start making this peptide, and then they take the leaves and they chop them and extract the peptide out of them. The advantage is making the peptide the traditional way can cost for a gram at least $20,000, a little more than that, and a gram made in plants can be $50. So it makes a therapy um, cost effective. It makes it something that people can afford. And this is sort of how it is, the seeds of the plant. So this is not like outside this huge field. It's an indoor facility where everything is controlled, temperature, everything. Um, so they put the seeds of the plants. This is all automated in these holes. And the plants grow out in these trays with these grow lights. And then they can engineer them to express the peptide. And it's all, um, you know, there's a robot that goes up and down, ensures the water and all that good stuff. So that's sort of how it's made. So what are we doing? So now with this peptide make in plants, we are getting close to phase one clinical trial in humans. So I don't know how much you know about the phases of clinical trials, but you first have to start with phase one. That's in the red. Phase one is in a small number of volunteers, and you just check that something's safe. That's the first step. Once you know it's safe, you go to phase two, where you show that it's effective that it changes fibrosis, for example. After phase two, you can go to phase three where you pretty much do the same, but now you do it in a much larger number of patients. And then the FDA will review and determine if you need any more than that. Before you even get there, you need to get approval from the FDA. So we actually went the week of Christmas and met with the FDA. We had what's called our pre-IND meeting that was um, very interesting, very exciting for me to be able to get to that phase. Um, this is the, the group that went together for the FDA trip. So this is sort of where we are. You know, we started with increased collagen, then we found a piece of collagen that we're developing, hopefully as a therapy, um, keeping fingers crossed that it will work. You never know until you actually do the trial. But I hope that at least I've given you the message that finding a cure for scleroderma and for fibrosis is not a mission impossible. Um, my lab is working on it, but there are several other labs across the world who are all developing their own molecules that are potential therapies as well. So it's a really exciting time for fibrosis and scleroderma because there are a lot of things in the pipeline, a lot of drugs in the pipeline coming from a lot of different labs. And I know research is expensive, so as you raise funds and support research, just keep in mind that if you think research is expensive, try disease. And this is a quote by Mary Woodard Lasker, who was a huge um, supporter of research and was a, a major influence in increasing the budget for NIH and increasing support for research. So also a good quote to know if you uh, meet with potential donors or on your advocacy trip.